Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here with your hurricane outlook and discussion for Wednesday, the 19th day of May, 2021. I am still in Texas, as you can see from that backdrop there on the thumbnail graphic and title card. Why am I in Texas? Well, it's severe weather season, and we take advantage of that to do some testing of some of the equipment that we will use during hurricane season, putting to use a lot of the actual live cameras and other technology that we would use in hurricanes to test in this background environment of potential supercells, hailstorms, uh, just general bad weather. You know, we can test in the backyard all we want, and that's boring. So bring it out, you know, when it's wintertime. I do this during lake effect snows and nor'easters and blizzards. Done this for about the last seven years or so, taking advantage of out of the hurricane season weather events. And now, thanks to our support through Patreon, I'm able to do even more, and that's why we're here. I'm working with one of our supporters, Brent Lynn, who came up from the Virgin Islands to help out. And also, not only are we testing the cameras, but right here, this Herbie Jr., I'll tell you all about that in just a moment, the Herbie Jr. launch. What is that? Well, we'll get to that in just a little bit. But first, it's more or less hurricane season. I mean, it is officially in the Eastern Pacific, and we're almost there in the Atlantic, but whatever, Mother Nature doesn't go by calendars, and as such, we do have this area down in the Eastern Pacific to watch. Only about a 30% chance of development over the next several days. It's well to the south and west of the Gulf of Tehuantepec right here. There's Guatemala, Guatemala if I can say it, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras over here, so not to worry even if it were to develop into a full-blown hurricane, which I doubt that it will. There's not a lot of model support for that to happen. But even if it did, it's going to move west away from land. So if you have any interests in southeastern Mexico or Central America there, no worries. This is all moving away from that area, so it won't cause any problems. Always good news to hear that. On satellite, this is what it looks like real quick. Just a fairly concentrated area of convection another way of saying showers and thunderstorms speaking of convection look at all of this sitting over the lone star state and now some of the action trying to stream north at least some of the high clouds as a huge bubble of high pressure starts to develop over the eastern part of the country this upper level cold pool of energy getting stuck and it's been here for several days and that has been responsible for the tremendous rainfall in areas like Baton Rouge, all the way west through, you know, hurricane-battered Lake Charles, all the way down through Houston. Wow, it has just been a time of it, and it's not even officially hurricane season yet. So we need some time to dry out, please, and hopefully we will get it. But that's what things look like in terms of the system in the Pacific. Next, we're going to focus on this piece of energy up here as this giant bubble of high pressure develops. It kind of acts like a big wave, and it breaks off over here into a cutoff low. I'll show you that graphically on a model in just a second. And that brings us back to the outlook for the Atlantic. Yep, we do have an area here circled in yellow, northeast of Bermuda, which is right there. And this is non-tropical in nature, meaning that it's not coming from the tropical regions. It's not warm core. It's a mid-latitude disturbance. It's not tropical at all, but it might try to develop more subtropical characteristics over slightly warmer water, um, and, and in some cases maybe even significantly warmer water than it's situated over now. Basically, it's going to be complicated, first of all. Second, not to worry, even if it does develop, it might bring some inclement weather, additional wave action to Bermuda, but that's about it. One thing it could do if it does develop is give us another named storm before the start of the hurricane season, officially anyway, uh, which is coming up on June 1st. So let me explain this very complex feature to you <laughs> to the best of my ability. <clears throat> so first of all, if we look at the European ensembles, that's what this nice graphic, this animated graphic from the weathernerds.org site shows us we pay attention right in here, we can see that the ensembles of the Euro, which is a whole bunch of different members of that model, kind of like getting a consensus, they're indicating over the next several days, 
this goes out to 10 days, that yes, we will see low pressure develop in this circled area. Uh, those are all the different members of the ensemble that show action. You understand there's 51 ensemble members and a good group of them, as you saw there, indicating that we would see development of low pressure somewhere in the vicinity of Bermuda. So as it runs again, you see it's not like there's, wow, Mark, there's like whatever that is, 15, 20 low pressures in there. No, 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 no. Those are the different members of the ensemble, and that gives you an idea of the confidence of the models. You know, does the ensemble, again, it's just like asking one person their opinion versus 50 people about a certain subject, and you get a consensus on it, and it helps you to decide the result of whatever the question is. And in the case of modeling, ensemble forecasting is much better to follow than just one person's opinion, so to speak. The GFS operational, the European operational, the Canadian, whatever. So that's why we look at ensemble forecasting. And generally speaking, it looks like something might try to develop here to the north and east of Bermuda. Looking at it from the GFS perspective, uh, same kind of thing. This is the 500 millibar height of the atmosphere right now. You see that right there? And here is the energy today. Actually, let me outline that. Let's use purple. Here's the energy that we see today in the modeling. And you're going to notice this big ridge of high pressure builds over the east, acts like a wave, and cuts off this low pressure area. And it's able to try to develop some. See? There it is. It gets pinched off. And you can see over the top, it literally looks like a wave coming over the top, kind of breaking, just like you see out in the ocean. Very similar. The atmosphere is fluid. In fact, this is a better uh, animation of it. I created a little GIF animation from Tropical Tidbits. So watch what happens here. You get the big high pressure that builds over the top, and then this little piece breaks off here. It's cut off from the flow stays over this warmer water, relatively speaking, and tries to develop. Now, speaking of warmer water, where are we talking about? Well, out here, generally, in this region, where water temperatures are not 26 degrees Celsius. 26 degrees Celsius, that's about what you need for development. So you might be saying, and I told you this was complicated, well, Mark, how is it going to develop subtropical or maybe even tropical characteristics if it's not over warm water that's you know would give us hurricanes like 26 27 28 celsius basically 80 degrees fahrenheit or higher here's the answer in the upper levels of the atmosphere the air is abnormally cold and if you know your severe weather you have to have cold air over warm air so that you can get lift that's called instability and if the air is warm throughout the column from the surface of the earth to the stratosphere if it's uniform um, it's capped you know there's no way for the air to rise there's, there's no cold air for it to rise into so the colder anomalous air sitting over this part of the Atlantic right now in in that big wave break that we're seeing in the modeling that's gonna allow this to develop more convection and so the water temperatures will aid in that. It's hard to explain. I know it's crazy, but sometimes you get this kind of development even in sub-optimal uh, sub water temperature settings, okay? Because of the extreme cold air that is sitting on top of the relatively warm water. Because you got to admit, 22 degrees Celsius, which is lower 70s Fahrenheit, is a lot warmer than the water temperatures up here in the North Atlantic where we're talking single digits Celsius and Fahrenheit. So that cold air sitting over this um, warm water will lead to the convective processes that could give us a subtropical system and if it develops enough, you never know, it could eventually become more tropical in nature, but I doubt it. The bottom line though, just the general takeaway is it looks like we're gonna get some kind of development out here over the next few days and it won't be of much consequence to anybody there's Bermuda right there you know maybe some inclement weather in Bermuda but nothing major you could certainly use the fresh water to fill up your tanks your cisterns right you know the, that's how you get your fresh waters from rainfall generally 
So this would be good for Bermuda in that regard. So something to watch, nothing to worry about, and no, it's not a sign of a terrible hurricane season to come. Here's the modeling, by the way, for the system in the Eastern Pacific, which is right here in the first frame. And this is about 5,000 feet in the atmosphere on the GFS. You see what happens. There's a little bit of energy there. Go back and forth. Nothing real stout with it. Just a little bit of a sound like Bob Ross here. Just a you know, cute little low pressure area there. Um, seriously, though, no big deal. Just a small low pressure system might go on to develop. Not much chance in the overall modeling of it. So, as I said earlier, not to worry if you live in Central America or Mexico. Interesting, too, that the Climate Prediction Center mentioning that as we go forward, an increasingly favorable environment in the Eastern Pacific, especially in the week two time frame down here, could lead to tropical cyclone formation. And out in the Western Pacific as well, near Guam and maybe the Northern Mariana Islands. So something to watch for as we move through the latter days of the month. All right, as I mentioned, uh, one of the things that we want to do out here is, Brent and I, is to test various equipment, the live cameras, some of the weather sensors that we use, a new vehicle cam, as I mentioned, um, a lot of back-end stuff. We have several people helping to produce, like you see on television. We're doing the same kind of thing, people helping out to get different graphics and all kinds of stuff going, and all of that has to be tested. So the one thing that we're also doing is testing this weather balloon uh, idea that I came up with, what is it, 2021, um, almost 10 years ago now. Wow, it's hard to believe. And we call it Herbie for the Hurricane Research Balloon. Everything has to have an acronym, H-U-R-R-B, or just Hurricane Balloon, whatever. And my version of it was kind of this box and made out of a Pelican case, weighs about five pounds, and all of the equipment is inside of the box except for the GoPros. Hotel room's falling apart. The GoPros are on the outside of the box. Well, Brent came up with an alternate idea that we call Herbie Jr. It's two pounds made out of carbon fiber, and it's shaped like a triangle. Here is what it looked like when we launched it yesterday all right, you ready? near Trent. Let her go. There it goes. See, it's a triangle. So it's much more stable but the equipment is exposed so we have to try to figure out a balance between the hard case and the weight of course that goes with you know weight as in how much it weighs my box versus this triangle right, you ready? Yeah. that brent has come up go. with there it is again so the um test yesterday uh the balloon made it to about 86 87 thousand feet which is fantastic for its maiden voyage, Herbie Jr. there. Uh, we were able to track it using APRS, which is an amateur radio beaconing system um, on my call sign, and also with a satellite tracker called SPOT. Everything worked fantastic except the GoPro quit after one hour, and we don't know why. So we're gonna test it again today. That's why we're here. You test it, you run it as much as the budget will allow, and you see if you can get things to work perfectly because when we do this in the eye of a hurricane, and I guess I should mention that's the goal, is to launch this in the eye of a hurricane, that's gonna be hard. So we want the testing to be easy. So today, we're gonna to test and launch from the Vernon area uh, in Texas. Interesting, because I was just there a few weeks ago for a supercell that cut across to the south about like that. You probably remember seeing that on my Twitter and elsewhere. Well, we're in the same area. We're actually in Wichita Falls today. So we're going to go back over to Vernon and launch. And according to the high-altitude ballooning site called HabHub, highaltitudeballooninghub.org, if you want to call it that, habhub.org, you can see the URL right there. According to that site, this is what the path should look like today. We launch here in Vernon. It takes its sweet time ascending uh, through the atmosphere, way on up into Oklahoma, bursting hopefully south and east of Lone Wolf, and then it drifts down into the atmosphere again, you know, the thicker part of the atmosphere, uh, and lands somewhere south of 
152, 54 area, maybe. Maybe north of the Wichita Mountains. We'll see. That's a long trek. And a big reason is we have a fairly slow ascent rate of about four meters per second because it's not a very big balloon. Um, it's only a few hundred grams, whereas the one for my payload that I designed is a 1500 gram balloon and it has a lot more lift. This goes up three, four, five hundred feet per minute or so, and my payload rises at about 900 to 1100 feet per minute. So it's just a faster ascent rate. So we have to maybe adjust, put a little bit more helium in this one today, which means it should burst at a lower altitude and we might be able to shrink this track a little bit. Uh, but the bottom line, that's what we're going to be doing. Once we're up and running, we will stream live on the public YouTube feed so that you can watch as things either go completely right or horribly wrong. And if they go horribly wrong, we'll keep working on it until they are perfectly perfect. Uh, and remember, this is all supported, 100% of it, every bit of it, through Patreon. And there's that link down there just kind of on the graphic. Patreon.com slash Hurricane Track. You can get involved with this. You can help out. This is what we do with your investment. We have over 600 people now trying to grow it. You get access to the behind-the-scenes stuff on our Hurricane Track Insider site. Truly an amazing use of the crowdfunding. That's how we do it, through Patreon. Anytime you're ready, we're glad to have you, and I think you will really enjoy what we're doing. And you get to be a part of it, and, you know, literally and figuratively, just you know, through your help, your support. And some people like Brent, they come out and help out. What a world. It's just incredible. All right, and I'm also on Twitter, of course, at Hurricane Track. And subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hopefully you like the video. If you like it, apparently you hit that button and it creates better algorithm results for us. I don't know. The YouTube world is, I've been with it since 06, but I'm just in the last few years really understanding what I have here on YouTube. And um, I appreciate you watching. That's the bottom line, right? All right, well, that's it for me. I'm going to zip my uh, pie hole here and get out of here and get ready to do some testing. As always, I appreciate you tuning in and giving me a listen. I am Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. We'll see you from out there on the Texas and Oklahoma highways as we launch the weather balloon later today.